Charana, thank you so much for your empathy, for your courage, and for your action. How about another round of applause for Charana Bach? Woo! Oh, is that on? Oh. Hello? Yep. Oh, it's on perfect. <laughs> um, before we begin our, our brief chat, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and also reinforce those powerful messages from Antoinette, that we know that people in marginalised communities, particularly Indigenous women and children, experience these issues that we're talking about at an exponentially higher rate. I'd also like to thank Artie Anne for her beautiful welcome. Tarana, we've had the great privilege of travelling a bit together this week, and I have to say, I don't know how you do it, especially after working in this sector for 30 years. How are you? Well, oh, <laughs> what do you mean? Yes, how are you holding up? First, I have to, to stick, take a step back and say, Tracy, I want to acknowledge you as well, and I forgot to do that in the speech, and congratulate you for also accepting this award, and thank you so much for creating this space for us to chat. So, bye. <laughs> How am I is somewhat of a loaded question, particularly now when I'm not really sure what day it is in Australia. <laughs> um, but I am, I am okay. I, um, I don't want to be dishonest in this question. I get asked it all the time, in this answer rather. Um, I am constantly trying to figure out what okay is. And I think that's just the reality in this work or in work that is similar to it, that um, you know, I already had to figure out what boundaries looked like for me and what, excuse me, self-care looked like for me um, before the viral moment and all of this attention. Um, and that has shifted again, and I've had to figure it out again. What I can say is that I do believe in boundaries. I do believe that um, they're very necessary for us to, to survive in this work. I am often uh, invigorated by the people around me, particularly survivors who are just you know, wide-eyed and ready to jump into this work and, and just so ready to put their, themselves um, on the front line. And I, I have a very, you know, I have my daughter's here. Oh, there. My daughter is here. Um, you know, one of my favorite people in the entire world. And so I draw a lot of strength from my child, from my partner, from my friends. So I just, I just keep it really close. Um, and I just, yeah, I'm just still figuring it out. Yeah, you take those moments to heal when you need to heal. Yeah, I mean, healing is ongoing. So I am, you know, there are some days, and I, and I tell survivors this all the time, I have so many people who say to me, oh, you know, you've done so much work, I can't wait to get where you are, or I can't wait to get healed like you. And I'm like, that, that's not how it works. <laughs> you know, I still get triggered. I still have very bad nights. I still have times where, where, where the trauma that I've experienced takes, takes hold of me. But the difference is I have this body of evidence now that lets me know that I don't live there. What used to happen was that when I would have bad moments, I felt like that's what I deserve, right? I would have, this is, this, is, this is just where I live. This is where I have to exist and dwell now. But I have built up the muscle, because healing is a muscle that you have to keep exercising. And I've built up the muscle strong enough now. And my little, my little box of, I, I want, I'm trying not to say arsenal, because I'm trying to be nonviolent, but. <laughs> But the little box of things that you can use, I've, I've collected enough evidence that lets me know and lets, allows me to work through those moments because I know I won't stay there, yeah. you know? So it's just, it's a, it's a work in progress. We're all a work in progress. We're all figuring it out as we go along. And I try to pass on what works for me to other people and then to help people figure out what can work for them. Yeah. You mentioned the other day that People keep coming up to you and saying, when's the next big Me Too moment <laughs> like this? And you've described it as a star in a jar. And that's just not going to happen again anytime soon, is it? I doubt it. I doubt it. I mean, I think we'll probably still have the big salacious headlines and the blah, blah, blah person who got accused of blah, blah, blah. But that moment that we had when Me Too went viral, that first 24 to 48 hours and that first week and in the, in the first year, we just won't have that. I doubt that we would have that again. And I think that we can't rely on that 
to, that's, that, that's not even sustainable, right? It's not sustainable to think that a movement can be grounded in a viral moment, you know? And I think part of the reason why Me Too has succeeded to move beyond that viral moment is one, it had a foundation that started before it, but also myself and others who do this work were able to come in right away and say, we have a vision for a way forward. And so what people have to understand is if you are passionate about this work, or even if you are just have a modicum of compassion about the idea that we should not live in a world with sexual violence, you can't wait to be energized and excited by the next shiny thing that happens. You have to know that when they stop reporting about it on CNN or the BBC or the ABC or the CS, CBS, whatever you, SBS, you know, whatever the, cha you know, when, when it stops being a topic of conversation in the media and it stops being this salacious thing that gets all kind of attention, there's still going to be sexual violence. It's still going to exist unless we are intentional and committed to interrupting it every day. And that has, that is unrelated to any headline. Let's drill down a bit on that because there's a lot of activists and advocates in the room here to a lot of wonderful people. Yeah, thank you. I tried. A round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> when we're at a, a time of uh, pretty extreme backlash, it has to be said, mm -hmm. how do activists and advocates keep going? And is it about storytelling or policies and procedures or cultural change or is it everything? Well, I'll take those as two different questions. I think one, you know, I, get, I also get asked often, you know, how do you keep going with the backlash and da 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 And I'm gonna say this to folks in the, in the audience, particularly those in my tribe who do this work. It's just like, well, I don't wanna get too deep, but I was gonna say it's just like Christianity, but you know, this idea that we have to be martyrs or that you have to be, to martyr yourself in a particular kind of way in order to be, um, to, to say that you're doing the work well. And so many of us who do social justice work in any form, but definitely around sexual violence, um, feel like we have to martyr ourselves. And so what I say to people who say, well, I'm burnt out, what should I do? I say, quit. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, I'm not being funny. You can come back, and more than likely you will. But I have put this down several times in the last 30 years, right? I have had to step back or move and do other things. And I think that we have to understand that in a movement such as this, particularly with so many of us who are at the forefront are also survivors, your healing is also movement work. And so if you're tired and you're burnt out and it's too much and you can't take it, do not push yourself beyond your limits because that's not effective. That doesn't help the movement. What helps the movement is to have healthy whole examples of what healthy, whole people who are in the healing process look like. So take care of yourself and heal and do the work that you have to do for yourself because that is also movement work and be okay with that. Don't let anybody shame you or make you feel bad or make you feel like, oh, I gotta get back out there, I'm not doing enough. Anything you do toward the work of ending sexual violence is enough. And working on yourself is that work. The wonderful Archie Law said before that peace can only come from justice. Mm -hmm. So how do we seek that justice and what does it look like? You know, again, justice looks different for different people. And we can't, I won't be prescriptive and say, well, let me tell you how justice has to happen. Because what looks like what I need for justice is, is different with some, with, from some, what somebody else might need. And so justice starts with accountability. And accountability can look many different ways. It just has to be led by the person that was harmed. I think that part of the problem is that, and I've, I've, you know, forgive me if you've heard this, I talk about this a lot, but part of the problem is that when we think about justice, our framework for justice is crime and punishment, yeah. right? We've, we, most of us grow up in societies that say, you, this is a law, you commit a crime, you get punished in this way. But so much of what we experience in sexual violence doesn't rise to the level of crime. And so then what do you do? What does justice look like for you when you can't put a person in jail? And if you, even if you can put a person in jail, we know by statistics that so many of these cases don't ever get to see the inside of a courthouse or even a police squad, right? So if you tie 
your healing or if you tie your the idea of justice solely to this idea of crime and punishment, there's going to be a deficit there without question. The focus, I think, has to be on harm and harm reduction. That is, that is the, a, a shift in framework, and it gives you an expansive idea of what justice can look like because it gives you an expansive idea of what accountability can look like, right? And then as a survivor, you can say, this is, you've harmed me in whatever kind of way. And then I have the choice about what I need to feel whole. Justice has to start with what the survivor needs. And the survivor has to be the one leading that conversation. And so if we could shift our framework and think about the ways in which people are harmed that have nothing to do with crime. If you harm a person, just the laws of human kindness, I don't know, I'm making that up, but just, just if you're a decent person, right? But if you harm somebody, you should have to be accountable for that harm. That could mean a conversation. That could mean any number of things, right? But, but we have to move away from this kind of finite thinking about justice because so many of us won't ever see it. Mm. While we're reframing the language and the debate, mm -hmm. I was very interested in the terminology used at the National Press Club about it being a public uh, epidemic. Yeah, public Do health we, crisis. Public health crisis. Do we need to talk about it more from a health and safety framework as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a... This is a most people think about sexual violence and, and it's very individualized, right? And so it becomes your problem, not our problem. And so there are several ways that we have to shift that narrative so people understand and take it away from the individual. So what happens is that people engage the virus from a place of pity and a place of need. So you need resources. Oh, you poor thing that's happened to you. Let me give, you know, we do need resources. I'm not saying that, but, but that's where people stop. Because if you only stop at putting a Band-Aid on it with the resources, then that shields you from looking at the systemic problem. It, sh it shields you from looking at the systems that are in place that allow the proliferation of sexual violence to happen, right? I'm going to put some money on this, and then I'm going to take it back because you don't really need that much. And so the, 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 some of the ways that we have to, um, to change that narrative are very important to the progress of the work around ending sexual violence, right? It's just... I call it. A, I, I talk about it as a public health crisis because I think people need to understand just how pervasive this is. At the at the health at the uh, press club, I use the example of a, an infectious disease because I think that helps people to see and understand because they think about their own sex, um, health, and safety. But you had 12 million people respond to a singular hashtag in 24 hours. That's an incredible number of people, and every hashtag is a human being. Every hashtag is a person who sat behind their computer contemplating if they should do it or not. What happens if they say it? What are the consequences of this? It was decisions being made. These are real people connected to real life stories, and if you think about 12 million people tomorrow, if we woke up and 12 million people said, I have this thing too, I've got it, and she's got it, and he's got it, and they've got it. Like, across the world, people have this thing, too. But you can see it. It's a rash on your arm, or it's a, a thing that you can look at, right? The questions will be completely different. In fact, there would be questions. And they wouldn't look like, well, how do we date now in the age of this nasty disease? Do you know, can you imagine how horrified we would be if the newspapers covered this thing like that? It just makes no sense to me that we don't think about the people who actually said me too. And for every one of those 12 million, there's probably five more that couldn't say it or couldn't use the hashtag. So we absolutely have a public health crisis. If you are not a survivor, you know one or both. And that's the reality of what we're dealing with. People, and that's why it's a dangerous narrative to think of me too as a singular, in a singular area. Sexual violence happens on a spectrum. And I'm talking about from harassment and, and lewd and rude language that is, that is um, sexually violent or inappropriate, all the way to femicide. It's a, it's a huge spectrum. No, I'm not trying to put all of those things in one pot. 
But I'm very clear that if we don't deal with harassment and nasty jokes about rape and, and rape culture and all the things on this end that people think are benign or not really harmful, those things create a culture that allows for violence to happen. So they are just as important. We don't deal with them the same, but they have to be dealt with. Mm. And what so many people are saying now is, oh, you're making too much out of this. This person is just friendly. They just want to hug. It's just a joke. I like to laugh. I love jokes. But there are tons of ways to tell a joke that have nothing to do with rape. Mm. I highly recommend everyone in the room, yes. Have a look online at the sexual violence pyramid because that is exactly what Tarana has articulated so well here. Speaking of which, you have a tremendous power of influence with your language and your cut through and your eloquence. It's true, you're an incredible influencer and I don't mean in the kind of Instagram language. <laughs> How can all of us in the room use our own power with our families and our communities to convince those who might be apathetic about Me Too? You know, there's so much. This, this has to happen kitchen table by kitchen table, living room by living room in so many ways. And so, I, you know, I get a lot of questions about folks who say, you know, I get it and I understand what Me Too is about, but when I go home, you know, my uncle says so-and-so. And, -so. and in, on the one hand, there is a way that I, I understand that it is too hard to try to undo what's happening in your family. There's some ways that your grandma and your uncle and them are just never gonna be different. But there's also, there's, there's a, I'm gonna be sappy for a minute. There is a love connection that I think we don't um, make use of enough. So for instance, this is what I mean. I had a student once who said, I want to tell my mom about what happened to me, but I don't think she will take it well. She may not believe me or, you know, my mom and my dad. And I, and I said, you know, I get that some people are difficult. I get there are cultural differences that, that, that many people respond to it. But at the end of the day, most of the people in your family or your loved ones want you to be okay. And so their entry point into understanding this movement or this work is through your personal story. And so where it is appropriate and, it's, and, it's a, and you think it can be effective, I encourage people to, to use their personal stories in their families or to connect it to things that they understand and they love, right? It, it's really important for us. You know, I used to get really irritated, <laughs> and I think a lot of feminists do, when, you know, men would say to me, oh, I love the work you're doing because, you know, I have a daughter. <laughs> I was like, I'm sort of a human being, but it's okay, you know. <laughs> You know, I, and I would say, why can't you, why can't men just understand this is about humanity? And they should, <laughs> fellas. Um, stop talking about your wives and your daughters as if that's all that matters. But also, I don't push back against that anymore and too tough because I will take any entry point available. If you are more interested in this work and understanding this movement because you want to keep your daughter safe, that's fine, come on in, we will take you, and hopefully by the time you leave, you will see that all women are human beings. <laughs> but whatever the entry point is, I think it's, it's fine. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to fight with men about why they are here, right? I don't want to fight with people. I had a, my, my um, child is gender non-conforming, and it, it has allowed me, I remember when they came and told me that this was their identity, and I was very like questioning and asking all kinds of things and you know, just bristling at it. And I, fa I fa fancied myself, you know, I'm a social justice person, I'm very liberal, and you know, when they came out as queer, I was like, of course you're queer, that's wonderful, right? You know, and then they added this other layer and I was like, huh. And I remember this, in the United States there is uh, enormous, and it, it may be here too, I'm not sure, but there's an enormous issue of black trans women being murdered. And I remember when I was reading these stories about these black queer trans women being murdered and thinking about my queer black child that is in the trans community, that is gender non-conforming and has friends who are trans. And I realized just how um, disingenuous I had been prior to that. 
my concern about the LGBTQ community was making sure I said LGBTQ. And I made sure I added them in when I talked about blah, 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 blah. But my, my concern changed when it became my child's life might be on the line. Right, so I don't begrudge men who say, oh, I'm doing this for my daughter or my wife, because I get it. We are connected to things that are connected to us. We are more connected to things. So I'll take you however you come. Uh, I don't even know if I'm answering the question now. I'm just kind of... You uh, have answered just it. Just kind of ch chatting. Beautifully. <laughs> you have answered it beautifully. Thank you so much for your pragmatism, your wisdom, and your deep well of courage. Please thank Tarana Burr. Thank you. <laughs>